The reason we have spent so much time talking about the abolition of man, the radio talks that C.S. Lewis gave in 1941, is because really those ideas become the story that hideous strength. In a sense, that hideous strength is the third novel in a trilogy that embodies the ideas in the abolition of man. In the opening of the story, in the opening of the story, Lewis writes, in the story, the outer rim of that devilry has to be showing, touching the life of some ordinary and respectable profession. I selected my own profession, not because I think fellows of college more likely to be thus corrupted than anyone else, but because my own profession is naturally that which I know best. For Lewis, as a professor, he set that abolition of man in the university, and he says it's mostly because of the vocation that he knows best. But it's also because that abolition of man really has to do with education. Fundamentally, how are we corrupting the next generation? What fallacies are we passing down? What are the ways that we are forming them or unforming them or malforming them from the way that they need to be? What is education? In this sense, it's one of the reasons I chose this novel over some of Lewis's other novels to really pass on these ideas to teachers to look for what ways are you irrigating the desert and not just cutting down the jungle. I think this story is a story about education and the errors that lead us towards evil versus the ways we can educate toward the good. The previous two novels before that hideous strength, we will not have time necessarily to read. I shouldn't say that in case this course gets used. Please cut. The previous two novels that lead up to that hideous strength are called Out of the Silent Planet and Paralandra. Out of the Silent Planet takes place on Mars and Paralandra takes place on Venus and as you'll see in that hideous strength it takes place on Earth. The reason we have these two prequels to that hideous strength, Out of the Silent Planet really involves the space travel that was so attractive to Lewis. He read a lot of science fiction and at one point turned to his friend Tolkien and said, maybe we should write the kind of stories that we like to read. And Tolkien decided he was going to write a time travel epic and Lewis was going to write a space travel epic. Well, Tolkien never finished his, but Lewis did finish his. These two stories are the outpouring of that pact made between friends. In the first one, Ransom, the main character, is kidnapped and taken by Divine and Weston to Mars. Divine will later become Lord Feverstone in that hideous strength. Weston, unfortunately, well, maybe fortunately, will die on Paralandra. The two of them are going to colonize other planets. And this is an idea, of course, that has picked up steam even in our own culture. If you ever watched Space Force on Netflix, boots on the moon, the idea that you will colonize space, that it is the next frontier. Because Ransom is a philologist, and in some ways people think then he was modeled on Tolkien, he learns the language of the different species on the planet, out of the silent planet. There are three different species, and Lewis does say that he modeled this on Plato's Republic, having the worker, the soldier, and the philosophers. And these are the people who populate this planet, but of course they're in different shapes and different creatures, and we won't dw dwell on them too much. Um, but once Ransom gets to the end of the last realm, kind of the highest realm, and gets to know the philosophers, he gets to hear about his own world. And what is revealed to him about his own world is that it is the silent planet. Fulcondra is what it's called in their language. It is the planet that the other Eldils, which will come into play in that hideous strength, Eldils being like angels, Eldils have become silent. They are the fallen angels that rule Tholkandra. And he hears this from the Oyarsa of Mars, what is also called Malacandra. In Paralandra, in the next journey, instead of being on a rocket and dealing with things, of course, that Lewis didn't understand and being taken to outer space. He travels via celestial coffin. And of course, this has the death to self metaphor there inscribed in the idea of the coffin. 
and it's celestial since we ended out of the silent planet, recognizing that it's not just space travel, but it becomes supernatural with the intervention of the Eldils. This time the Eldils are directly involved and they take him to Paralandra. When he arrives, he discovers it's an Edenic world of floating islands. Nothing has become founded, solidified. Um, there's much more freedom here, not in a sense of license, but in a sense of true liberty. And when he arrives, there is a green floating lady. She is the Eve character that he begins to become familiar with and tries to understand her way of thinking in the same way that when he was on Out of Silent Planet, he tried to understand their way of speaking. Unfortunately, Weston intervenes. He travels there to Paralandra, and at this point, it is no longer Weston, but Weston has become fully possessed by the bad Eldils that he was inviting into his life in the earlier Out of the Silent Planet. And those ideas have become ideology. And what Lewis shows is that bad ideology becomes possession. And it unmans you. It become, makes you less than human. It moves you more towards nihilism and away from being. And we'll see how that plays out in that hideous strength. The end of it, though, is a note of hope as uh, the Green Lady is united with her Adam and it ends in a beautiful dance, much like Dante's Paradiso. That hideous strength also shares a lot of connections with Dante, but more of Dante's Inferno. So it's a little bit out of order here to have Dante's Paradiso juxtaposed with the next book in the, in the trilogy to be the Inferno. Um, I'm not sure you could make the same parallel with Mars being Purgatorio, but Lewis does draw quite a bit on his knowledge of Dante and the medievals. So that hideous strength begins in our world. That hideous strength has been called a Charles Williams novel written by C.S. Lewis. And what the writer of that line means is that this novel, much like Charles Williams' novels, instead of the character leaving our familiar world and traveling to an unfamiliar world, which is usually Lewis's formula. If you think of the Chronicles of Narnia, you go through a wardrobe into the next world, and that's where he writes his fantasy. In this one, the supernatural breaks into our familiar reality, which is a Charles Williams formula. And so this, this world becomes the world populated by the Eldils, we get to see the bad Eldils versus the good Eldils and the fight between the demonic forces and the angelic forces, but they take place in a very familiar world. One set at the beginning at a university, at a Brechton College. That hideous strength shows these warring powers and it also in some ways becomes very confusing, much like The Man Who Was Thursday. George Orwell, when he reviewed the novel in 1945, said that one could recommend this book unreservedly if Lewis had kept it all on a single level instead of breaking in the supernatural in the confusing and undisciplined ways. If we compare the novel to that, to The Man Who Was Thursday, you do get a sense that you aren't going to be able to answer all of the questions the way that you cannot answer all of the questions in The Man Who Was Thursday. Both novels, in that sense, retain some of the mysticism that Lewis and Chesterton were so drawn to in the Christian tradition. They are not going to try to give you all of the easy ways of understanding, especially the most theological questions or the biggest problems. What is evil? Where does it come from? Um, but also, who is God? Is there any way to understand God? A God that we understood would be less than ourselves. And Lewis has the same application here when you get to see um, the Eldils as representatives of Maladel, the great, the greatest angel of all, or in this sense, God. The novel begins not with Ransom, who we do not see until later, but with Jane Studdock and Mark Studdock. And the two of them are on parallel journeys that we watch throughout the course of the novel. Jane and Mark are supposed to be married, they should be connected, and instead what we see is a move away. We see a breaking down of things. Uh, marriage should be the end of a comedy, right? 
that comedy is the bringing together, the unification, and that's what we saw in Paralandra. The Adam meets his version of Eve, and the two of them have a great dance, a marriage ceremony, a festival of joy. Instead, this novel begins in a marriage that is in fact broken. The opening words of the novel are Jane repeating to herself what marriage is supposed to be as she heard pronounced over her during her marriage ceremony. And yet she's finding that the reality doesn't match the words that took place within the ceremony. As we get to find out more about Jane and Mark, uh, we do have some problems with Jane's characters, which I would like to unpack. Jane Studdock bothers many women for her false portrayal, really, of what it means to be a woman. People say that Jane Studdock was based on one of Lewis's students, and this student was unhappy in her marriage. She wrote many uh, letters to her professor talking about her dissatisfaction with marriage, and I'm afraid that Lewis probably was less than, uh, although he was amiable and tried to be sympathetic, at the same time, he was holding the line for what marriage should be, and this was prior to his own marriage. So this is written in 1945. So Lewis is not married. He will not get married uh, for almost two decades after this point, and he does not have a lot of women friends at this time. He starts his correspondence with Dorothy Sayers in 1942, so this is early on in his friendship with her. But as we'll see, that friendship between the two of them affects the way that he views women and also his friendship and then eventual marriage to Joy Davidman affects the way that he writes women. At this point writing Jane Studdock, he writes her misogynistically <laughs> and he does not show her in her fullness as a person. She's um, somewhat of an airhead, uh, flitting emotionally uh, every time that she has a dream or an encounter that she doesn't understand. She becomes fearful and tearful and then hates herself for being tearful and it's a caricature of a modern woman, the way that Lewis disdained the idea of a modern woman, one who wanted to be educated. She's trying to write her dissertation on John Donne and is failing and then goes and buys a hat. So this kind of caricature of a female. What we will want to do is follow her development over the course of the book though and look at what it takes to change a person or convert a person to faith, because I do think that her journey towards faith is very similar to Lewis's journey towards faith. And also we'll see Marx in contrast to this as he moves via negativa towards an opening up to the possibility of faith. And I think in this sense, Lewis is drawing on his own experiences, which is also why it's important to read Surprised by Joy prior to reading That Hideous Strength, even though they were written 10 years apart. Surprised by Joy is written 10 years later because it gives an understanding of what this journey from imagination to intellect to change of will looks like for Lewis and why it is that he writes Jane and Mark Studdock's journeys towards conversion in the same way. Jane begins the novel having dreams that seem to pertain to reality. She becomes what is known later in the book as a seer and she is able to see through the poor characters of Feverstone, who she says has a mouth like a shark, and Frost, who literally makes her so uncomfortable when she sees him at a distance that she runs the other direction. In contrast to Jane's ability to see is Mark's blindness. Mark has what Lewis would call a desire to be in the inner ring. As long as you are governed by that desire, you will never get what you want, he writes in this essay. You are trying to peel an onion. If you succeed, there will be nothing. Until you conquer the fear of being an outsider, you will remain an outsider. What he's talking about here is this idea of the inner ring is a false, it's an erroneous desire to be on the inside. What does it mean to be on the inside? It's not something permanent. It's not something substantial. At the beginning, we get to see Mark's desire to be in Curry's set when he's at the college. And then when Curry leaves him with Feverstone, he suddenly wants to be in the inner circle with Feverstone at Nice. Then when he's at Nice, he wants to be in the inner circle with Frost and Wither and Hardcastle. But what he finds is the inner circle, the closer you get, the more you lead towards nothingness. When Mark, out of his desire to be liked, actually leads to committing criminal acts, 
he finds it's almost as though he has jumped into a river that is moving and his decisions move him downstream. What we see is that he's become enslaved to, to these desires and he is not a free person making his own choices, but the decisions slide past him or he slides past the moments where he could have decided something because he has already decided to be in the inner ring and therefore that has removed him from some of the other ways of being free.